You are listening to a Clark's World Magazine podcast with your host and narrator, Kate Baker. Greetings, Clark's World citizens. I hope this podcast finds you well. I have not been well. I think I mentioned on the last podcast that I had gotten some con crud at the Nebula conference. Well, it stuck with me for quite a while and it wiped me out, so I apologize for the delay in the podcast this month. I still have a little bit of a cough, but overall I'm feeling much better. So I'm going to try to knock these podcasts out in the next week. Actually, I have no choice. <laughs> anyway, thank you for your ongoing patience, and thank you for your support. And for those of you who haven't supported the magazine, you can go to clarksworldmagazine.com forward slash donate, or our newest venture, clarksworldcitizens.com. Our second story for the month of June 2018 is titled Vault, and is by D.A. Xiaolin Spires. If the name sounds familiar, this author has had two other stories in Clark's World Magazine. November 2017 brought you Presetio Plastics, and August 2017 brought you Twisted Knots. D.A. Xiaolin Spires counts stars and sand residing currently in Hawaii. You can find her embarking on olfactory odysseys as she inhales plumeria blossoms, poke, and poi. If you walk along the beach, you might find this writer vaulting headlong into the salty seas or stepping into a shimmering portal to symphonize with her quantum double in Asia. Her work appears or is forthcoming in various publications, such as Clark's World Analog, Fireside, Terraform, Nature Futures, Grievous Angel, Reckoning, Galaxy's Edge, and many, many more. She will be delivering a lip-smacking, savory academic presentation Test Tube Reared and Seared, Food in the Future in SF, at Worldcon 76 in San Jose, and hopes to see you there. In terms of digital spheres, you can find her on her website or on Twitter at Spires Writer. Her website is daxiaolinspires.wordpress.com. So, my dear listener, I hope you can sit back Relax, and let me tell you a story. Chen Gueng hikes up her sleeves before vaulting over the pile of fuzzy moss and greets Lucas with a nod. The chloropolyurethane fabric flaps in the slight breeze, and the double suns beat down onto her arms. Lucas fishes in his bag next to his tent for a bottle of sun soak, and releases the spray, running it generously over his sol-flex-covered arms, torso, and legs. Your head, Chen Guang says, and he smiles, as if he hadn't been doing this for years. Can't reach, he says, lying, and Chen Guang knows he just likes the attention. She grabs the spray and discharges that exhale of mist, covering his football-shaped clear helmet. She even sprays some on the clear, hard arc under his bearded chin. She turns the mist onto herself, bringing down the spray over her exposed transpendex inner layer, the foam frothing up at her arms before becoming clear, encasing the invisible solflex pores of her fabric. Lucas watches her as she sprays down. That's probably enough, Lucas says. You don't want to drown yourself and run dry tomorrow supply. Cheapskate. But Chen Guang knows he's right and slides it back in his sack. A coin catches the light. His calm. She grabs it. You almost forgot this. Like I would, and risk not being able to talk to you when we're apart? Very funny. Put it on. He does, affixing it to his chest. I don't know how you have it like that, just dangling from your neck. His voice comes through his piece and projects into her pendant. It feels nice. Plus, I hear you loud and clear. She stretches now, getting ready for the run. Her pendant chain slides about near her armpit. She holds it to her chest, reaffirming a silent promise to her sister. (sighs) Won't feel so nice getting snagged on a branch. Chen Guang gestures out as she pulls up her leg. Near his tent, Lucas brings his head to his knees, arching his back and groaning. They wrap up the tent sheet around their legs, its fibers assimilating into their pants, attaching itself to their uniforms. Chen Guang kicks up her legs, feeling the lightness of the tent. 
She hitches the bag with the rest of her limited supplies onto her back. Come on, old man. You see this wide expanse? Not a tree in sight. Doesn't mean there won't be one. I'm not too worried, Chengwang utters before she starts off on a sprint. Lucas follows at her heels, his shoes sinking into the foamy terrain in rapid strides. They jump, leap, roll, wind up, and do it again. Their legs traverse the terrain of Sugui, picking up speed like a vacuum picks up dust. Cheng Wang feels the wind in her hair and sprints past a tangle of mossy vines. Out of her peripheral vision, Cheng Wang sees Lucas next to her, jumping over a mound and kicking off a verdant growth, to spin into a roll as he keeps going. He's showing off, telling her he can keep up even doing spins. She picks up the pace. When the wall arises before them, she leaps up and attaches herself like a cat, her transpandex fingers reaching over the top. Her body sinks into the wall, as like everything else, its facade is full of moss. Her right leg kicks off and she reaches with her arm, throwing herself over the edge. Her hand slips. Lucas is right behind her, and his jean-blazed thigh muscles have no trouble leaping up and perching on top. He offers her a hand. She grimaces, lets Lucas's hand dangle, and picks herself up. She feels the sole flex suit, covered in spray, picking up the heat of the sun. She takes a second to catch her breath, and Lucas adjusts his helmet. The sun warms her, and at the corner of her helmet, the hollow light shows the powers at half capacity, filling up notch by notch. She needs to be faster. Mine's saying two-thirds full, says Lucas, as if reading her mind. Yeah, mine too. Chengwing's not lying, she tells herself. If she squints, it kind of looks like the bar's higher. You think we'll meet quota before the sun's set? Chengwing's mouth beats her brain. Yes, definitely. Or else you can have my thermal blanket. She shuts her eyes, wishing she hadn't promised that. Over the wall, the hills fill their eyes. Beyond that is the industrial wasteland. They only stop running and leaping after their feet, backs, and arms map out their jaunt through the hilly stretch. Chen Guang's muscles ache, but she doesn't want to admit it. She shakes out her legs, pulls back her neck. There's a change going through her. She used to be able to run for days without pain, but then again, she used to be able to jump twice the height Lucas jumped earlier today at the wall. Today, she barely got past it. Hey, you okay? Lucas looks genuinely concerned, probably for himself. He knows he can't do this alone. Yeah, she stares at the industrial wasteland. The two suns are waning now, Sola closer to the horizon than Solo. Lucas's hazy shadow lengthens against the concrete at the hill land's edge. His green eyes glint in the pink of the dual sun evening light. You have the ease lap, she says. Lucas undoes a pocket at his triceps and pulls out a few blue glowing stickers, disengages them from each other. He selects two, hands them over to Cheng Guang. It can't be that bad, can it? It's not. Just preventative. Besides, the sticker will provide some light now that the suns are retiring on us. Barely, says Lucas under his breath. Cheng Guang keeps her eyes bright and open as she slaps them on, even as the telltale searing pain reaches her knees. She's not going to give in with any wince or reaction. The stickers release inflammation inhibitors. The burst of prickling tells her that much, at least. What's your charge say? Cheng Guang asks. She feigns nonchalance, ignoring quivering knees. Lucas's pupils veer right and his hands twitch, moving phantom controls. Cheng Wang watches as he waits for the bar graph in his view to convert to a figure. 93%. I figure we'll be in the sun for another 10 minutes. Not running and leaping, so it's not going to climb exponentially. Well, it'll probably get up to 95%. Yeah, that's pretty safe. I'll be in the clear all night. How about yours? 89%. Cheng Wang says. She grits her teeth, more like 72. That's pretty good, says Lucas. 
well, 95's not 100, but it's pretty close. I guess I won't be needing your thermal blanket. I'll do okay with my own. You can have it. I, I promised you 100%. Nah, it'll just get too hot. But Cheng Wang knows that's not true. The blanket's optimized for perfect temperature. No shivering and no sweating. No excess heat or cold. With two blankets, once the bats run out for the night, for the first, the second one would take over. Without it, they'll just have to do with a dire chill. Negative 50s or so degrees Celsius chill. They bask out in the sun, drinking up its energy. Lucas just lays back, but Cheng Wing's arms and legs scissor open and closed. Jumping jacks to accelerate absorption. Any movement prompts magnified absorption rates, but running, leaping, and gaining ground does it most. Something to do with your heart rate, acceleration, and even psychological thrill all interacting with the inner soul flux machinery, amplified too by a generous coating of spray. She huffs, scissoring her arms and legs as she watches their shadows get longer and longer until they merge with the dusk that surrounds them. Dinner goes by without a word. There's really not much to say chewing on vapor bars. Can't really comment on the taste because it's just coagulated Nutri powder. Cheng Wang grabs a second, but Lucas's hand comes down on her wrist. There's too much iron in it, he says. It might interact with Eslaps. Really? She gives him a look like she might bite his hand, and he pulls back. Suit yourself, he says, but she's already tossed it toward her pack. It clatters against her helmet and tumbles to the ground. The bright, sleek wrapping stands out against the dull, dark concrete, reflecting the artificial light emanating from the ray fabric slung up against a ledge. There is no natural light tonight. Clouds have completely enveloped this planet's one moon. They rely on the ray fabric and its harsh white light. Lucas whistles as he sets up his tent. Cheng Wang remembers the song as she starts to emancipate her tent fabric from her legs and spread it out before her. Clear, the white waters, she says. Where I was from, it was cool, the white waters, Lucas says. He pulls off his coin calm and drops it into his upturned helmet. What would it be like to get in, she says. She sits down under her half-pitched tent, waiting for it to inflate. She stretches out her legs. To envelop in water. You are enveloped in water, made of it, says Lucas. He's uncreasing every bit of his tent with his transpandex covered hands. You know what I mean, she says. I remember when we had water. Trickles to splash on your eyelids, mist to clean off your skin, your elbows. That was years ago and worlds away. Better to focus on the project at hand. Lucas was systematic in his manual uncrinkling, even if it would be done by the inflator anyway. His thoroughness reminds Cheng Wang of how he runs and leaps methodical, making sure to cover the ground and air, checking for sharp edges with the heightened instinct of his body, as they're trained to, even in his lightning speed. She sees that concentration all day running through his aerodynamic mask in that focused look in his eyes. You think the cat balls will really generate enough power? It'll make a lot more than we can. Enough to rent all the tech? The hydrogen harvesters, transporters, and hydro generators for Claris? It'll do some, but you might not want to hold your breath on that liquid immersion. A bath. They called it a bath. Yeah, well, the best you can do is dream about it. We're about to enter Wasteland tomorrow, and the specs say that's as dry as a bone. Bone? But that's us. I thought we're made of mostly water, you said. Bone. Desiccated. Nothing but bone. Bone. Pinched dry like everything else in this sector. Cheng Wang massages her knees, looks out into the Wasteland, the geometric shapes of a past civilization now all dried to stone. Before she can duck into her tent, Lucas walks over, fishes in his bag, passes her a package with an attached flex straw, a sippy, about a cup's worth of water in a bag. Won this years ago as a medal, parkour championship, been holding on to it, weighing me down. She looks at it, feels the weight. It's liquid, all right. And Lucas has been running with this strap to him the whole time? 
She looks up at him, but he looks down, veiling his expression. I, I can't take this. Take it. It's dragging me, slowing me down, and you need it for your knees. N no, I'm, I'm fine. Then do me a favor of helping me get rid of this. I don't have what it takes to appreciate it. To me, it's all the same, whether liquids shot fed through skin microhydro generators from tiny spurts of hydrogen and oxygen, or if I gulp it down and one go through my esophagus. Makes no difference. He looks up and gives her a nod. Chen Guang sees a hardness in Lucas's eyes, a stubbornness that won't back down. But you've never tried gulping it. I have. I've won more than one medal. A pretty good sprinter and leaper before you. Please. Is if they'd send anyone less than a champ to work with you. Chen Guang stares at Lucas, who's doing squats, with a huge grin on his face as if to prove his point. His eyes, though, belie something. Regret, possibly. All right, Lucas. Thanks. But no more favors. It's not a... Chen Gueng ducks into her tent, swipes on her thermal blanket as the chill settles in. She pulls a swishy package of water onto her chest and watches it rise and fall underneath the blanket. Water, she thinks, as her eyes fall to a close. She's never had so much at once, not since twenty years ago, when she was eight and her grandma splurged on a pack. She remembers sharing it with her little sister, Xin Yao, gobbling most of it up and leaving her only with a mouthful. In her sleep, she dreams of broken legs. Broken legs mean no levers for that fulcrum hip of hers to move, little heat generated for the night, and no work for creds to pay for her relocation debt. She calls out in her sleep. She dreams of her mother and father, selected to fight the fire so rampant in her homeworld, never to be seen again. She dreams of their voyage, sent off for a better home, and Xinyao, orbiting with the sieve still caged in a temp cell waiting for enough water on Claris to emerge from the hive. She thrashes about in her half-lucid state. Her mind fixates on the sheer ingenuity of that tech borrowed from the High Institute, funded through expending collected resource of their homeworld. Their last big hurrah for their best and brightest. The journey, the rocket, glorious things the High Institute owns. She'll probably never see interstellar tech like that again. Only cat balls. Efficient. Good for short distances sensitive old scrap low-tech for low-end space riffraff like her. Low-tech she has high hopes for. She dreams of it zipping by her, beating her in speed and grace, though she would be off-planet by then, once the cat balls make enough energy for hydrogen tech rental, as they all hope, the zapping for water will be a cinch. With a start, she remembers there is water balanced in the package on her chest. Her legs ache. Water. She dreams of tasting it. It tickles her tongue, dapples in specks of moist cohesion on her lips, washes down in a surge. When she awakes, she starts, thinking a package has broken and all its treasures have leaked out and seeped into the parched concrete, but she feels no wetness. It's still there, intact. It's warm. She's cold. She realizes she's awake not from the nightmare of disappearing H2O, slipping away from her, but the reality of chill. She didn't collect enough sun. She breathes out, sees her breath, precious heat and humidity escaping. She puts on her helmet and she feels immediate warmth, the last dregs of power still caged in there. But she can't rest her back onto her pack, not without the helmet's aerodynamic wedge getting in the way. That leaves her chilly body. The pack, at least, is warm against her skin. She remembers that water is a good conductor, and the packaging's got that heat tech. She rubs the pack around her body, shivering. She pushes it under the blanket, willing it to stay warm under the covers as she swipes the pack around her. The rubbing generates more heat and her hands are methodical, making the pack move in strategic ways, as strategic as the two of them, Lucas and Chen Guang, like a pair of lone coyotes traversing the landscape. 
They are mapping out the best course, the one that gains the most sunshine and surface contact with least amount of risk. So when the cat balls are dropped, the tech will interact with the atmosphere and topographical elements of the landscape and accelerate with so much collected sun energy multiplied by the mechanics of their whizzing speed and ground synergies, they'll be priceless, chock full of power when harvested. Lucky so far that they've patched the sharp edges. The cat balls fly fast and accurate, but one touch at a point and their vulnerable surface gives, puncturing the irreplaceable tech borrowed by the sieve at great cost to them. Even if it was belittled low-tech, a drop in the bucket compared to the wealth and potential of the High Institute. When it comes to the High Institute, they'd find a way to collect for any broken rented tech, no matter how minor. Should the cat balls touch an edge, they'd snap. Like apocryphal soap bubbles popping, childhood dreams of water gone. Unable to sleep, Chen Guang stretches as her parkour and acceleration trainer has taught her. She hears her trainer's voice now as she reaches over to her ankles. Prepare the muscles. Sharpen the mind. As a human, you have an edge, instinct, and corporeal sense. You've got a gift that no bot could ever replicate. Somatics. An organic impulse that lies deep behind the gene-blazed muscles and uniform enhanced speed. There are phenomena on planets we can't anticipate to program into bots. You've got the skills, the training. Don't waste it. Wet it like a knife. Focus. Breathe. Keep your eye on the goal. Chen Guang rests the package of water in her lap, pulls in her right arm, braces it in the elbow of the other. Her triceps draw taut, making her suck in a breath. She never thought she'd be a cartographer, using her somatic experience to create the map for sensitive tech, but sometimes she can't think of any other job that would make her feel so alive. She wonders how the other recruits are doing, Aisha and Jayesh, her two best friends. Are they doing okay in Tilna? They volunteered together, unlike her, who volunteered alone and got placed with a stranger, Lucas. Lucas. She held on to her warm water bag. He's fast. Maybe she should have been paired with someone slower. She was once as fast as him, maybe even faster, but something on this planet's pressing on her, changing her. Her eyes fall on the swirling inflator at the top of the tent, a tiny disc generator that pitched air along the inner surface tent, rotating it looks like a planet. She imagines it swarming with tiny beads, all charging along on its surface. There are dozens of planets in the solar system, all to be filled with accelerating cat balls, all to be gathering energy for rental tech, for hydrogen capture and water production. For Claris, their only hope. She pulls in her toes, flexes her calves, then peels off the e slaps on their knees. They no longer glow, their medicinal blaze exhausted. She sticks it against the side of the tent, too tired to deal with it now. She removes her helmet and tries to think of the hearth, snap noodles, and other hot things from home. Her fingers run along her pendant, with her calm on one side and a picture of her little sister, Xin Yao, on the other. She falls asleep again as the heat of the water pack penetrates her transpandex and warms her abs. Chen Guang shivers as she wakes to the break of dawn and the breaking of Lucas's voice as he attempts to sing her awake. Stop. She can hear him both through the tent and through the calm. The scraggly, high-pitched pentatonic tune falters and grinds to a halt. The water pack has chilled, and she looks at it through the light of the morning. She can't drink this now. There needs to be the right time, an occasion. Basking on concrete in the middle of Sugwe, at the brink of wasteland, is no way to celebrate with a cocktail this precious. H2O, she slips it in her pack, glides out of her tent in a swift slide, and wraps it all up. Once they wrap, strap, fold, and tie, they're ready to set off. This time, Lucas jumps out first, his bound energy as taut as coiled springs, and he rockets forth as if pumped on juice, an old homeworld expression when juice once existed. She follows behind, the twin suns already opening up the world with light. 
They bound across the abandoned industrial landscape like two fleas on a bear, except instead of fur, stained concrete meets their lattice neoprene soles. For all the time this place has been abandoned, no plant life breaks through the hardened cement. There's a dispossessed feeling in the air. What happened to these people? Cheng Wang breathes out as she runs. You didn't take a look while you were stopping by base for the new assignment? Didn't get a chance. Was checking up on my sister in the hive at Civ. Cheng Wang slips over a railing and Lucas vaults over it and lands on two feet. Uh, oh, the hive. Sobering place. So, this here was Tanesh Town. When I checked back on the base, this industrial park long ago was the production center of Kinofrain, the textile coating that housed the smart fabrics made to filter toxic chemicals. Kinofrain? Hasn't that been outlawed? Yes. Lucas jumps ahead and puts his hand on what looks like a smokestack before swinging his legs over it. Let me guess, making Kinofrain also involves releasing toxins. Cheng Wang merely skirts around the smokestack-like protrusion before jumping over a gap. Yep, one of those pollute-to-get-rid-of-pollution deals. Guess they lost out. Kind of. Depends who you look at. Many did lose out. There were mass deaths of workers, at least according to the base briefing. Violent stuff. First you get a rash and a cough, pretty innocuous. But then your hands turn red and bloated and you can't work. You slowly go blind and your lungs lose function. Those were the common ailments. Zheng Guang rolls from a jump as she listens. Pretty awful. She sees Lucas hopping from one cement circular vat to another. The vats look like places for drying some liquid. And that's not even the worst stuff. Do I even want to know? Limb detachment. And there's more. He pretend cuts his arm before using it to pivot over a gate. Then he runs and leaps across to the next building over. This is why I don't like to read the briefing. It's never they all had perfect health and beautiful descendants and happiness. Cheng Wang follows suit, but has to attach herself to the wall like a cat barely clearing the ten-foot gap. If they did, we wouldn't be here, staking out their derelict remains, mapping out their territory. True. Chang Guang's back met Roof in an impeccable roll, and she gets up without stopping. Her helmet cuts through the air as she leaps again. The unfortunate ones are the ones that didn't survive long enough before the big move. But they all took the able workers out of here once they created enough fabrics. They thought the fabrics they created would fix this place up, but the fabrics couldn't filter these toxins. They only did grade C, and the ones released here were some of the chemicals under grade E. Too bad. They did a pretty good job building these structures. She swung her legs through a gap between a vat and what looked like a drying lattice. Yeah, they're pretty sturdy. Lucas tapped on the cement before doing a spin off a wall and onto another neighboring one. Good call. I think we need more spins. Yeah, quadruple the solar intake. Cheng Wang pulls a 360 as she kicks off the ledge of a roof. She feels the rays coursing through the chloropolyurethane, hitting the Solflex absorbers, and a ping goes off in her helmet, alerting her of high intake rate achieved. I don't know, Lucas. Some of this is pretty sharp. I think we'll have to go through this again and note where the patches need to go. Too bad we just can't tear it down. Historical planetary code. You know we'd be indicted by the High Institute in a hot second. Yeah. But I have to say, there's something charming about this place. You just like how the concrete feels against your legs when executing your spins. Cheng Wang pulls another spin off, her spiral unwinding from her legs. When she missteps, she stumbles and catches herself right before a roof edge. She slips then. Her heart jumps as Lucas grabs her arm. It starts to slip, the transpandex on his fingers and her inner arm garment sliding past each other. Whoa! Lucas pulls her up. His fingers slip again. Cheng Wang reaches with her other arm, pulling on the chloropolyurethane sleeve of his jacket, finally latching onto something with slight traction. Whoa is right! 
Cheng Wang kicks up against the side of the building and pushes herself up. She looks down at the side as they catch their breath. That would have been a 20-foot fall. Though a protrusion from the wall might have saved her a broken spine by breaking something else. You, uh, okay there? Lucas does some jumping jacks trying to maximize the solar intake. That was weird. I, I felt like something pushed me off my spin. You know, spins aren't so hard to control. Once you're moving, you've got momentum. I'd say some momentum. You nearly spun yourself out onto a multiple-story drop. Cheng Wang sat on the side of a vat, her eyes shifting left to right and her fingers moving, calibrating the fabric to her nerves. It's fine. They're attached, but just in case I reconnected and connected to them again. You want me to check it? I mean, not to be forward, but I can usually feel the incongruities. Lucas pauses in his jumping jacks, raises a brow. No, no, I think it's fine. You know what it felt like? Scary. Cheng Wang shakes her head, like someone pushed me. There's no one here but me, Cheng Wang, and you know I know enough not to pull any pranks. She gets up, looks over at the rising twin suns, and starts doing jumping jacks herself. After the chill of last night, she knows enough to try to osmose as much sunlight as possible. They run again. She's feeling pretty good. She got in five vaults and three good rolls. She's starting to forget about the strange feeling in the air like being jerked off a trajectory when her foot slips at a jump. It doesn't slip per se, it feels like it's being pulled. Helmet hits concrete as she bangs into a raised structure in the shape of a cone. Her head reverberates in the football-shaped piece of clear armor. She sidesteps and avoids falling over as she experiences a wave of nausea. Okay, that's it. We're stopping, says Lucas. Second time today. No. No, I can go on. It was just a tug on my leg. I think it's time for a bar break. Lucas sits down right where he is, onto the rooftop ground. No vat or raise up to park his rear on in sight. The smokestack to his left comes up over his head and is simply too high, though he could probably scale it. He looks like he's contemplating doing so as he focuses his eyes in that way. Then he tugs off his helmet, pulls out a bar, and chomps on it. Air's not too bad now, he says in between bites. He wipes his mouth with his sleeve. Dry. The briefing said all those abandoned years finally cleaned it out, but, but it took a long while, and still the toxins might be stored in this moss. Chen Gueng ignores her own stomach growling and approaches the site where she felt the tug. She's looking at a structure that has a concrete panel up top and one below and just a window to slide through. This is where she tripped, trying to vault between the two panels through the three-foot aperture. She kicks it. What do you suppose this is? I don't know, a place to hang something? Or maybe a shrine or something? They had a crude religion back then. She peers at the shadow of the structure. The dual suns make a dark slat on top and bottom, like an enlarged sandwich of the home world, and notes the fuzziness of the penumbra. There's something off. She accelerates to try to vault through the aperture again, but the space between the two concrete panels seems impenetrable, and again she hits concrete. That's weird. You hurt yourself again? Lucas approaches her. No, I'm okay. I was kind of expecting it. Come and check this out. Cheng Wang tries to pass her hand through the hole in the two slats, but meets a resistance. Lucas tries, and his hand slides right off. An encasement? Cheng Wang asks Lucas, wide-eyed. No, their tech wasn't advanced enough for that. Cheng Wang places a note into her map log of the anomaly. This'll need more than a patch. If the cat balls hit this... You're right. They'll have to get rid of this. It's altering the flow, but they, not us. We're not being paid for reconstructions, just mapping and patch noting. Plus, we'll let the higher-ups handle all the historical planetary code red tape. Cheng Guang removes her helmet and pushes against the space. What are you doing, Cheng Guang? Just set it aside. Let them handle it later. You need to take your bar break, and we should get going. She sees Lucas standing up, holding his helmet akimbo in his right arm. 
She feels a sucking feeling at her hands and legs, and she's pulled in. A pop at her back ends the vacuuming whoosh, and it is all dark. Lucas? Chen Guang's voice echoes in this expanse of dark. A vortex of light opens to her right, and she sees a warped head and legs emerge from a point in the dark. It's Lucas. As he enters the space, the light bends, his figure elongated as he pulls himself through, and it closes behind him. It's dark again. Hey, Lucas. Chen Guang. His voice is low and resounds against unseen walls. Where is this place? Did we just enter the structure somehow? I... I don't know. Lucas's voice uncharacteristically wavers before it quiets down in the darkness. Chen Guang remembers listening to her grandma talk about physical experiments of the past, pools of salty water that deaden sound, eternal blackness to sharpen the mind, a chamber, her grandma called it, one that dispossesses you of your senses. That was before the planet went up in flames before she bid her grandma goodbye as she left her behind. Deprived. She feels like that now. There's an ache throbbing within her. A light comes up in the corner and they walk toward it. It feels like an infinite space, past that lead in every direction. But they move toward the light. They don't run. Somehow it doesn't feel right here. Chen Guang moves her legs almost robotically toward the rays. The light becomes bigger, brighter. And they see it now, and when it becomes the length of a vapor bar, palm size, she stops, and Lucas halts behind her. They're standing five feet away. Chen Guang feels Lucas's breath before her steady in and out, in and out. What first appeared like the vapor bar is rectangular and long, a series of small cubes arranged next to each other in a line formation. Pulsing light. Lucas's loud breathing seems to skip a beat. And Chen Guang feels, too, something caught in her throat as an array of sensations overtake her body. Her head feels hot, her limbs cold, her spine feels a chill pass through it, and her legs feel a searing heat travel through them. Her pendant with her calm lifts up and yanks at her neck. It's pulling toward the light. She grabs it, trying to push it down to her chest, which is thumping. Cold. Cold. Lucas has stepped up towards it, and he's reaching. No! cries Chen Guang, but Lucas is faster than her words. He swings his helmet and captures that lit-up bar no bigger than a packet of gum, like he's playing catcher at meteoroid pitch. The sensations in her body fade, her temperature returning to normal, and she's tugging at her chloropolyurethane sleeves again, doing anything to make her feel like she's got control of her body. She moves up to Lucas, but he reaches his hand into his helmet towards the light. That's not a good... She starts to say, but a deafening high-pitched buzz fills her ears, and then there's a blast, and she expects to hear an explosion, but only hears that shrieking buzz as mushrooming light blinds. The feeling comes a moment later, lifting up and being thrown up against something. Her body hurts, aches that fill not only her body, but also the inside of her mind. The air in her chest collapses at her intake of breath, and she sees through her closed eyelids the brightness that could only be two suns. She forces herself to open her eyes. Lucas is rolling back and forth on his back on the roof ground, holding up his knee to his chest. He's wincing and moaning to himself. Crap. Chen Guang wills herself up and tries to knock some sense into Lucas. He looks up at her and shuts his eyes, opens them again. She hefts him up, despite his muttering objections. Her knees shake, but she's got him. He's heavy, at least heavier than she imagined. His arms and legs dangle out of her hug. Luckily, cartologist runners are more streamlined than bulky, so at least he's not too beefy. She pulls him away from his cracked helmet, moves him to the far edge on the roof. She makes sure he's all right. He's moaning, but otherwise okay, she guesses, and goes back and peers at the helmet. There's nothing in there now, just cracked shards lining what once was the perimeter of the head hole. 
She doesn't dare move it. Crap. How fast can he run without its aerodynamic edge? How much sunlight can he collect without its specialized absorption tech? He'll freeze at night. Without it, he'll definitely won't generate enough power to activate the heating cells in his blanket. She plucks the water patch out of her backpack, wondering if she should wait to give it to him as a warmer at night, like the way she used it last night, but makes up her mind and rips it open. Tepid water heated from the ambient air of this land of dual suns trickles down her hand. She rushes to lick it, and it feels startling and moist on her tongue. Water. She's careful as she brings it over to Lucas, lifts up his head and forces him to drink it. His eyes fly open when he realizes what it is that he is gulping. She realizes she's licking her lips and her throat's moving up and down, a phantom desire to taste what he's having, as she feeds the elixir of H2O to him. He looks bewildered and his eyelids shut again. After he has gulped down the bulk of it, his eyes open again. Just a few drops left that Chen Guang loathes to waste, so she rolls up the package, so light in her hands now, as a contrast to the luxurious heftiness of the water weight before, and stuffs the mostly packaging into her back. Maybe I'll lick it clean when we pack up for the night. Lucas's eyes clear up from the haze and look at her as she eats her vapor bar. She's trying to think to put together the many strands of thought entangling within one another. What was that? Where did we go off to? What happened to that panel block of light bits? What to do with Lucas and his busted helmet? Water. I wish I could have tasted more of it. The vapor bar shatters into dry bits in her mouth as she chomps. Cheng Wang. Thanks. She hears Lucas behind her saying. She stops staring into the sky with its twin suns and turns around. You okay? I don't know. M my knee's not right, but I think it'll be better. Cheng Wang fishes out East Labs and helps him put it on. Your turn for these. My helmet. It's a statement, not a question. Yeah, broken. What was that? I thought I'd ask you. You're the one who touched it. I'm not sure, but I'll admit that was pretty dumb. Easier to say now in retrospect. We had no idea what it could do. Thanks. Nice of you to say, though. I'm sorry. He casts his eyes down, and he does look penitent. He rubs the ease laps over his knee. Shiny blue peeks through his fingers to show they're working. Hey, you okay? Well, better off than you, she says, swallowing the last of her bar. So I guess you'll go off, finish the cartography? I can poke around here, look for some shelter for the night. Cuddle up next to some concrete. Cheng Wang shakes her head. I think we should go down. Down? Into the wasteland, into the buildings, not just graze the rooftop. There might be something we can use to get you warm, maybe some energy source, an old battery or something. There, there's nothing left. People left long ago. I don't know, I just get this feeling, you know? I felt something pull at me, twice. And that panel of connected cubes of light, maybe that has energy. Too dangerous. We're not playing around with that. I'm not suggesting that. I just mean, we won't know until we look. There's no way I can map out this planet alone in time. So if you're out of commission, neither of us will get our cred. You'll be frozen dead from the night chill, and they'll send new cartographers here. We'll be in debt paying for the commute and lift back. Well, I'll be in you too if you manage to stay alive. This is the best way. Plus, I don't know. I just get this feeling. Lucas shakes his head. Lucas, I saw an opening before. What? An opening into the buildings. They're not all sealed off like the High Institute's Historical Society claims. A space was overlooked. It's way over the side of one of the buildings, about five buildings back. If we could just make our way over there? You're crazy. You sure the blast didn't mess you up? Going back and entering this condemned space? 
Chen Guang hooks her arm into his elbow and helps him up. He limps, then shakes out his knee as he leans on her. He moves again and he looks more stable. The swelling's going down. You're going to make it. Lucky, no blood, no concussion, right? Let's go. He tries walking a few more steps. He squats and gets up. All right, hope you can leap. I'm heading over to the other side. Leave all the stuff. It'll just weigh you down. Latch onto my arm if you can't make it, and I'll give you a catch. Chen Guang vaults back, retracing their way back into the building before. She makes it, though. She's not as swift as she once was. She leans over the ledge and holds out her arms. She hopes she won't have to catch him. She's not sure if she can handle the weight after all. He runs, looks good, tight form, and jumps and vaults. It's clean and he lands with a roll onto the roof. He's still limping a bit. He's trying to hide it. They manage to leap, roll, and dash over to five buildings back. Chen Guang looks down the alleyway between two buildings. The black hole is there. A window that hasn't been sealed up. She feels drawn toward it, like a whisper in the back of her mind guiding her that way. When she sees it, something like congruity settles into her bones. We gotta go. You can make it, I know you can. At least the east laps will dampen the pain enough, yeah? She leaps back and forth between the building she's on and the other one that's slightly taller as she descends. Like a moth fluttering from one surface to another, she hopes, light and assured, until she reaches the opening at the wall. She perches on the windowsill for a moment, feeling the cool air of inside on one side of her and the heat of the sun on the other. Come on, she says into her calm, and she hears Lucas respond. She alights onto concrete a few feet below the window and follows the panel of light from the window onto the floor. Nothing. Again, she sees nothing. Before she can walk up and explore, Lucas falls into place behind her. Good, you made it. Now let's do a search. They spend about a half an hour walking through the place, lighting up the room with activated ray fabric. It's the most energy-efficient light they have, but it's a harsh white glow. Mostly it's just rough white concrete that looks up at them. Chen Guang spends some of her pent-up stamina on staircases, jumping up flights at a time, passing through the rails. She's beginning to suspect this to be a great waste of time, and Lucas was right after all, when her cartographer's scrutinizing gaze finds a deviation on the tiles at the bottom-most level, a carved depression hooked back like a handle. She slides her hand and lifts. A basement? She talks into her calm. Lucas, slide down the banister to the bottom floor and get over here. There's a route down here. She slips through, lands with a cat crouch, and walks in this dark tunnel. She's feeling out the hollowness and the perfect curves of the walls when Lucas joins her. Like, okay? Yeah. They walk what seem like ages. The path keeps going and going, a prod at the back of her mind telling her that she's messed up. Lucas is losing strength. She can hear it in his breaths, even if he tries to hide it. She's wasting time, precious time that she could be charting out the world, or at least soaking up the outside heat for the night. She prompts her helmet, and she's at 78%. Yesterday, she would have grown. Today, she's thinking not bad, given the circumstances. The route opens up to a clearing. Rather than empty space, the ray fabric shows tangles of webbing. She manipulates the fabric, shining the light at some of the strands. They're cords. Tangles and tangles of cords. She hasn't seen old tech like this in ages. She follows them to their mass clump at the center. An AI, whispers Lucas. A voice booms throughout the chamber. Chen Guang shines the ray fabric around, but the harsh light only illuminates cords, no speakers, but perhaps they're implanted in the walls and ceiling. The voice sounds like it's coming from everywhere. i Chen Guang elbows Lucas and points at his calm. Turn on the translator. She triggers her own. The voice changes, dark and silky. You've come. You were expecting me? Chen Guang gestures to herself as she walks forward, as if compelled by some force. Lucas puts a hand on her shoulder and Chen Guang startles in her path forward. 
The upgrades, they're overdue. Upgrades, says Cheng Weng. No, we're explorers, we're, well, cartographers to be exact, mapping out this land. No upgrade. Sorry, but no. Drats. This sounds vaguely funny to Cheng Wei, and she hears Lucas smothering up with a laugh with a cough. Who... who are you? Cheng Wei asks. I'm the Tattle, the Tanesh Town Center. I handle all the deliveries and packages. Last week we produced, inspected, and delivered 72,000 glons of Kinofrain alone even in the midst of the disruptions from the war. I managed all the trade with the outer worlds and accommodate the schedule of the workers. Workers, says Cheng Wang. She looks around, the room is bare except for the tangles of cords and them. Tattle's voice lowers. It seems awfully quiet. Too quiet for a war. Tattle, there's no one here except us. There was a war long ago. Long ago, the voice lilts, waiting for something. Not anymore, the city's been abandoned. It's silent. Only a light tapping sound at the center of the wire clump gives any indication of processing. Tattle's voice arises again. Ah, well, that explains it. Is it Cheng Guang's imagination or does it sound like its voice fell? I only awake when there's activity and a need. It is to save on energy. I must have been idle for a long, long time. Lucas whispers in Cheng Wang's ear. I'm going to scan the wires. Cheng Wang speaks up, keeping one eye on Lucas, who's running his fingers about a half a foot above a wire to her left. Uh, listen, Tattle, we'll report your existence to our contractors and... They might be able to get you out of here, or otherwise reprogram you for another use. More like resell you to a less developed planet. Uh, there's nothing left for you here. No, I must stay here. I know this place will repopulate again. It has so much to offer. The jungle, the soil, and the resources. All the Kinofrain. Kinofrain was added to the RSL... Restricted substances list, pipes up Lucas. For years now. Tattle's voice rises. I'll have to reorganize some of my programs, prioritize probing new resources. Tattle, hey, Tattle, listen. Before you do all that, there's something we need to ask you. There's a strange pull that I've been feeling messing with my movements. Part of it has led me here. A pull? Well, there's kind of a double panel structure up on the roof a few buildings down, and when I try to pass through it, it's blocked. But somehow, it led us to a dark space with a palm-sized slat of light made up of individual cubes. Did you touch it? Yes, and it exploded. Tattle's voice speaks definitively. Lucas locks eyes with Chen Guang and nods. Yes, Tattle, we reached out to it and it exploded. Landmines. Cheng Wang was thumbing her pendant absently, but stops. What? Planted by workers, bought off by the Cthal. I got rid of most of them, scour the buildings inch to inch, but some of them are deep in the subs layer, luring people in. I, I don't understand their mines? Yes, weaponized organics. I know there are still quite a few around. I tried my best. I really tried my best. I... Hey, Tattle, I'm sure you did. We'll need to get rid of them. They can't be here. I wish I could help you, but when the organics were dead, they were easy to discard. You just needed to wrap them in some malalophane. Now they're awake and their properties must all be different. Lucas stops what he's doing, his hand midair, and speaks up. Awake? Organics? You mean they're alive? These landmines are alive? If enough time has elapsed, as you say, then yes, they're alive. Lucas and I exchange a glance. 
Even in the diminishing light of ray fabric, I can read his expression, anxiety at the crinkles of his eyes, his mouth upturned. Triple crap. Are they conscious? Conscious. Are they intelligent creatures? I don't know. I only knew them when they were dead. They are easy to find and harvest, an easy tool for the Cathal, but I know the species has long dormancy. Not dormancy, death, really, as they have no vital signs. Vital signs of their own kind, that is. They experience a growth process thereafter. They start out simply as physical entity with no life to them, but the life sprouts later. The detonation still works while they are without life. It's called their mortem period. The explosives are the best, then, clean and with wide range. My directory tells me that when they are awake, their explosives are less predictable and less effective. Perhaps a small burst. Seems counterproductive to life to be able to explode like that. It's a protective strategy, you know, to protect the nest. In case someone comes, they'll detonate, but each detonation is unique and doesn't affect the other individual cubes. Their death period allows conservation. Only when resources are good and predators few do they come alive. Altogether, they form one big colony. They are harvested in layers and planted as mines. Do they communicate? Not when they're dead. When they're alive, what do they look like? Light. They light up, an indication of life. Isn't that like many other organisms? Not all, Chengwen says, looking at Lucas' ease laps on his knees. Their light is fading. We gotta go, Lucas says. He motions at the ray fabric. Chengwen was so focused she didn't notice how quickly the light had dimmed there, too. Just tell me if these landmines, if they're intelligent, if they communicate... If they do, then this isn't an abandoned area. It'll be rezoned and redesignated. I wish I could tell you. I haven't come across one. Maybe I will soon, though, since I'm awake now. Come back and visit me, okay? It's too quiet in here, and if you don't, I'll sleep again, and who knows when I'll awake. Tattle is still talking as they rush through the tunnel, the light fading quick. They need to rush back and retrieve their tents and packs before it's pitch black. Chen Guang's mind races as fast as her legs. They cannot, in good faith, finish their job as cartographers if there are living beings on this planet. As she sprints down the tunnel, she runs through her sensations from before, the pulling, the urge to get closer, perhaps pheromones or some other release of the organics. She's thinking of the sensations when she trips. No, not again. Lucas is there with her, snagged in the sublayer. They approach the light that pulses at them, the fragment of the slab that is the landmine. As long as we don't touch it, we're okay, I think. Just don't go near it, says Lucas. But he's disobeying his own advice, drawing closer and closer. So does Chen Guang. Her pendant around her neck flies up a bit, wavers and falls and flies up, in tune to the pulsing. She can't help herself. She approaches, closer. She feels a swarm of feelings in her body. She is warm-blooded. Yes, she is warm-blooded, but her toes feel like ice, her chest like fire, her eyes like a subtle warmth, her hands the gentle coolness of a spring day in her home world. She wiggles her fingers, her toes, and they feel like different worlds disconnected. A thought dawns on her. She breaks through the visceral impact of the feeling and turns to Lucas, who is spellbound, probably feeling all the same sensations. You, you think... you think they're communicating with us? The light pulses. No, they're just changing, just rhythmic on and off. No, the temperatures. You feel that? He draws up next to her, his misty breath of icy coolness tells her his response. I'm hot, cold, warm, everything in all different places. Cheng Wing closes her eyes, focuses on the different feelings permeating in her body. She imagines stalls, different stalls all over. They expand all over the planet. Stalls of different temperatures and the minuscule light cubes that bob along from one stall to the next. 
She sees many ecosystems in each stall, some filled with other organic life cohabitating symbiotic forms of activity. She opens her eyes. She's still in the sublayer space. She doesn't touch, but pulls her hand close to the cubes in front of her, emanating light. Each cube shoots out a different temperature, acutely different, palpable. Lucas, close your eyes and focus on your body on all the different temperatures. Chengguang shivers the chill in her spine deep as she closes her warm eyes again. She sees the image again, different stalls, life, organisms that look like trees, foliage and moving beads that slither on the ground, tiny wispy helicopters floating in the air. In each stall, are these cubes, like the ones before her in the sublayer, some clumped together like clusters emanating light in a particular heat signature? She opens her eyes only to see Lucas open his, his pupils contract in the growing light of the landmine. He strokes his beard with a hand as he drops his jaw. I can't believe it. They're communicating with us. By heat and cold. Do you think they're sending us some image of the past, of this planet? No. No. The files never showed the planet looking anything like what I just saw. Stalls? Cubicles, you might call them? Yes, with different flora and maybe fauna, if you could call them that. Some organisms, anyway? Cheng Wang feels an excruciating heat in her nose. Is it one of a scent? In her cold gut, she feels something like a yes, like something agreeing with her. The feeling grows. Not the past, she whispers. The future. Lucas stares at her with his strangely contracted pupils. Yes. Yes, you're right. It's their vision of their future. They're trying to tell us they have plans for this place, I think. Maybe. You might be right. The impression of her body being isolated into various cells and splashed with varying amounts of heat and lack thereof starts to dissipate. The light of that bar of connected small cubes grows dimmer, and once out of that trace of multi-thermal arrest, Cheng Guang realizes that their fabric ray light has died out completely. Without moving, they're pulled away from that sublayer space and return to their dark world in that abandoned building. No. Not abandoned simply derelict. They run, leap out of the underground tunnel up into the basement, feeling their way through. Their leaps, vaults, and tumbles are more cautioned in the dead of the dark, and they make gradual progress toward the roof. They are lucky the moon is out, not trapped behind clouds like the other night. The return of light graces them with their characteristic fearlessness to pick up speed as they spring and leap back to their tents. Usually bound by a fierce love of personal space, tonight Cheng Guang invites Lucas into her own tent. He refuses staying in his tent until she's sick of hearing his teeth chatter through the calms and utters, If you die of cold, I will string you up with the wires of the AI, and you will spend eternity with chatty tattle. Who cares? I'll be dead, he says. But his footsteps say otherwise, and she hears the sound of the breach of the seal as he fusses with the tent opening. At night, they lay side by side, neither of them cold, not until, at least, the collected energy powering the thermal blanket drains and the chill seeps in. By then, it is near enough to dawn, anyway. They'll survive yet another night. She grabs his hand, not out of romance, but a sense of camaraderie, or a feeling of being alive, or of feeling warm. She doesn't really know. He squeezes the hand back props up on an elbow and looks her in the eye, heat emanating from his skin. Last partner died of thirst. Accident. Microhydrogens. Short-circuited after a bad tumble. That sippy pack was to remind me of the dangers of these worlds. She nods, not sure what to say. She doesn't really cut it. This is their life, stark and cold. Light on our feet, but we all carry our burdens, she says holding up the picture of her sister. I do it for her. 
That seems to satisfy him. He lays back down, closing his eyes. She can feel the coolness of the pendant on her chest through her transpandex and imagines her sister's smiling face. There would be no energy harvest here. This place would be rezoned. That means no cred deposit for the mapping, no moving out of the hive for her sister and the rest of her hold-up hermits. But her sister is a softie. She would like the story one of a species discovered. With her free hand, Cheng Wang paws at her pendant, feeling its coolness in her fingertips. One thing strikes her. She reviews those sensations from the sublayer. In her mind, when she felt the discrete areas of different levels of hot and cold take over her body, when she could imagine the entity, that strip of connected cubes pulsing at her, making her envision the temporarily distant space, she noticed something. The imagined future that vision? It wasn't simply stalls of different levels of heat. There was something else there. She couldn't pinpoint it at the time because it had been too long. It became too foreign. But she knows it now, lying in the tent in the escaping heat, the chill breaking all logical resolve and allowing her mind to wander. It wasn't just temperature. There was a distinct feeling of heaviness, of a heaviness in the air that could only be moisture humidity. The minds, those beings, they didn't simply envision a future with various temperatures. They envisioned one with various climates, with dew, fog, steam. It was a feeling that had pervaded her nose, tickled her esophagus as it went down with the air as her body went through the shock of manifold degrees. Water. As she felt deep in her heart that it would be real, in her cold-induced haze of half-sleep clutching onto warm, rough hand, she knew this would be a place that exists. And not far off, but in the near future, the feeling she only now could disentangle, she realizes, is a process that had been catalyzed and was coming to life. A part of the communication, a pit feeling, that she could not fully decipher until now. And not only would this vision become real, but it would become a place that her hold-up people could trade with for the ever-scarce water. How the mind beings will make this water-filled ecosystem, she does not know, but there is much she does not know about the terraforming abilities of these creatures, only that they can explode and creep into atmospheric sublayers. But... She feels that if she closes her eyes and focuses on the heat in her body and drifts off mentally so reason no longer prevails, she can imagine herself and her sister in a time she cannot place, sharing a warm, thirst-quenching drink of liquid. Tea, she realizes, a warm, dewy mug of tea, with steam that rises and rises into the atmosphere. As she licks her lips, and falls asleep. There's some very interesting world building going on in here, quite literally, I guess. <laughs> I like the imagery of these two sprinters running through a world trying to map out the debris and issues that might cause this project from succeeding. I love the fact that they discover a new species not like anything you and I have ever heard of, but something glorious that can bring all of that stuff back. And in the midst of their despair and their loss of hope, hope is renewed. And I love stories that do that for you. What are your thoughts? You can leave us a comment or a question at the Clarksfield Magazine website itself, or go to the About Us page where all of our contact information is listed in case you don't want to make a public comment. A lot of you have been sending in emails in the last couple of weeks, and I hope to get to them very soon. Again, I've been sort of knocked on my butt with this cold. But thank you, because I read each and every one of them that come in. Again, I'll be sending these podcasts out as soon as they're done. So I hope you do come back and listen again, if you so should choose. And until then, be well.